The morning of January 15, 1987, my partner was up early as usual, and soon after leaving he burst back into our Lilliputian room, manic with excitement. The news was that we were flying. He ordered me to get up and get dressed, but I was desperately ill, and wanted only to be left alone, to die in peace. Furious when he pulled the duvet off me, I was relieved when he went into the bathroom, mistaken in the thought that he was backing off. While he was out of the room, I pulled back the curtains and looked out the window, stunned to be unable to see anything. We were in a blizzard, the wind stirring a whiteout. When I heard the shower turn on, it was obvious I was in trouble, a fact that was confirmed when my partner returned and unceremoniously hauled me from my toasty bed. Barely able to stand up and my last supper not wanting to stay down, I tried to swallow his reassurances. While he agreed that yes, there was a blizzard on the ground, apparently the meteorologist said we could lift off because the storm stopped at 5,000 feet. Suddenly very clear-headed, everything inside of me went into full-scale mutiny, as my brain demanded to know who in their right mind would go more than a mile high in the sky in this weather. I was certainly not about to do so. The more I thought about it, the more stupid it seemed to climb into what was essentially an oversized, squeaky wicker picnic basket, and one that did not even have a lid. When he came back into the room, I let him know that if he or anyone else was flying, they were all certifiable. I was remaining on the terra firma. Ignoring my objections, he unceremoniously tossed me into the shower and told me to give it up, because we were flying, and that we included me. Resistance was futile. No doubt, neither one of us will forget my final words, not in this lifetime. As they released our lines and we began floating upwards, chills danced up and down my spine, every cell in my body tingling with excitement as unbridled terror nipped at my brain. All queasiness was quickly pushed aside, awe triumphing over fear as the earth fell away and billowing clouds wrapped us in an opaque chalky whiteness. An eerie silence closed in around us. The only thing piercing the silence was the burn of the propane that sounded like the hiss of some magical dragon. Abruptly, we perforated the clouds and the vapors that only seconds before appeared to be as solid as stone, were seen for what they really were, gossamer that reminded me of cotton candy. Overhead, the morning skies were brushed with the purest blue pigments found in the goddess's paint box and mountain peaks, each more spectacular than the next rose to meet us. I remember laughing when a silly thought emerged from my brain as dozens of brilliantly colored hot balloons began popping through the clouds all around us. The image being that we were inside a gumball machine gone berserk. Because the flight was absent, the pressure of competition, we played with the wind and let her play with us, descending to skate across a frozen alpine lake where we raced with several deer. The frigid chill of winter was unable to diminish an ever-deepening sense of wonder, and most of the time, I was left alone in my reflective state. In an instant, everything changed, my supposed reverie lasting until some part of me heard the pilot say something about 12,000 feet. The problem was that I was not hearing him from my corner of the balloon. I was eavesdropping and observing from several meters away, outside the balloon. Bewildered to not be in my body, I was remarkably unruffled as the thought arose, Oh, I am not my body. Realizing that our bodies are just a shell, great houses, I knew it was time to go and in a single turn, left the only world I knew. That spiral changed my life as all my bonds with this world were released and I was ushered into a sacred space, the foot of the mountain where I would soon move with the music, ascending toward to a single point of light. The music. It was incredible. Even though I knew that I was dead, I felt safe, thrilled to be standing in the warm sunlight high in the alpine meadows of Mount Rainier, the majestic peak located in Washington State where I grew up. No words will ever adequately express the sensations that filled my heart as my paternal grandmother came toward me, her love flowing over me as her energy enveloped me. The last time we were together, was the summer of 1963, when I contracted spinal meningitis and she held me while my parents raced to the hospital. Bathing me with icy cloths as I fought for life, 
I always remembered how she alternated between telling me that I was going to be fine and begging me to stay. The doctors and my parents all discounted these vivid memories because I was unconscious. These were my last memories of her as she died shortly thereafter. Unbelievably, for years I carried a false sense of responsibility for her death. My childish logic was that her death was somehow the result of my illness. Such a notion easily took root because in my family saying goodbye and talking about death were forbidden, which meant the children never knew that for years she was fighting what would be a losing battle with cancer, complicated by diabetes. Now, after more than 20 years of silent, inconsolable grief, we were together again, walking hand in hand in this magical place. Communicating beyond the artificial boundaries of time and words, I learned that the hands on my watch were not the keepers of time. Sorrow disappeared as our love was redeemed from the illusion of oblivion, majesty taking on a new meaning as we were drawn higher into the valley. Moving toward the source of the light that seemed to fill this space, I remember taking great comfort in the firm ground beneath our feet. Still remembering the discomfort I'd felt listening to the squeak of what felt like a flimsy basket suspended beneath the balloon. Crossing the valley with extraordinary assurance, fully aware that we were traversing in a nameless frontier. It was, however, an exact match to the physical place I knew so well. However, this place did not in any way, shape, or form fit the description of heaven I was long been led to believe in. Was it a way station? An intermediary spot before getting to that other world I always hoped to be good enough to enter? Here, we watched the strands of days, cycles of months and ribbons of years braid together, fashioning a nexus between distinctly different nows. Thoughts of dimensions began rushing into and through my mind while we watched and felt different events and times flow around us. Each one was happening right here, right now. We were standing on the mountain of my childhood, but it was essentially different, real, but out of sync with all previous understanding, most notably, my concept of time. The heretical notions, long ago implanted during my outings with Sherman and Peabody, were now known to be neither childish nor eccentric. Walking in a world that was a reflection of the world I lived in for 35 years, I knew there were multiple realities touching Earth. A bell chimed loudly as I realized that nothing, not heaven or hell, or things on earth were good or bad, hot or cold, black or white, or up or down. There was no doubt in my mind that nothing was what I long believed it to be. While my world was flipped upside down to realize we are more than our bodies. However, a lot more of my illusions were tossed out when it dawned on me that somewhere along the line, I'd shed the heavy layers of winter wool and fur. I was now wearing the glorious black silk gown I wore to the Kaiser Ball. Before we reached that place, I knew we were going high above the alpine meadows. Everything changed, and what resembled an amphitheater appeared in front of us. On this stage, we witnessed a timeless encore performance of my life. Ninety degrees to our right, just within my peripheral vision, there seemed to be a doorway through which every person who'd played a part in my life emerged. The first to cross this invisible threshold were my grandparents, followed by my father's best friend, a school chum from seventh grade, and many others. I saw that their essence was distinct from all physical descriptions or character traits used to describe them. One at a time, they took center stage, each greeting me in the same soundless language my grandmother and I used, a communication transcending any spoken word. This memory always brings out a deep frustration, especially as I struggle to write about a communication that overflows with uplifting energy. After sharing what were only thoughts of love, they turned to exit through a door located on my left. With a knowing absent all doubt, I knew I was soon to join them on the other side. The last person to walk onto the stage of my life was a man I did not know, and upon reaching the center of this karmic theater, he turned to face me. In this instant, my vision was cloudy, almost as if a diaphanous veil was dropped over my visual field. While I could not see him clearly, the essence of his presence resonated at the depth of my being, communicating directly to my heart through the mind. His message engraved itself on my heart and seared itself on my brain. Lynn Claire, you will be a catalyst for change, for love. You will bring forth, hold and honor remembrance. You will bring to conscious awareness the realms, 
realities and remnants in order that the spirit may remember the dance and to return the sacred feminine to Sion. And we will meet in 27 plus 1. I recognized that what he said was a truth beyond anything I ever blindly accepted as real but had no idea what 27 plus 1 meant. The feelings that perfumed my mind and heart left me with a knowing that never abandoned me and then, and now, remains clearer than any other memory. Unfortunately, he gave me no clue to the fact that years would pass before the smallest bit of understanding about this task would come to light. Neither did he inform me about what would be required to make it its true meaning come true, once I understood. Leaving me feeling wholly remembered, recognized, understood and loved, he then turned and crossed back over the same threshold over which he came. This led to the realization that there are unbolted doors into different realms of time that are accessible to those who know how to find and open them. Moving forward, I promised myself to remember and find them. The Cusp of Eternity As unexpectedly as this experience began, it ended. Alone once more but knowing I would never be alone again, my grandmother and father rejoined me and we joyfully began to speak in the same vibrational language, partaking of a whole and holy communion. Taking of life, love, the mountain beneath our feet and the shimmering aqua sea I knew was just beyond our view. My father surprised me when he said, you can see me today. Instantly revisiting another time, I realized that one of the defining, life-changing events of my life occurred in this very place. June 25, 1977, while driving with my family down this very mountain following an overnight stay at Sunrise Lodge, I was suddenly unable to breathe. Forcing my husband to stop on a dangerous curve, I got out of the car and slid down a gravely slope my body and mind in agony. One stop ahead, I sat down on an outcropping of rocks as the physical, emotional, and mental throbbing worsened. It seemed to take forever before the physical pain began to subside, and I found the strength to crawl back up to the car. We continued our journey, but my husband, scared and mystified, ignored my plea that we stop and call home. When we arrived at our destination five hours later, Friends met us with the sad news that my dad suffered a fatal heart attack while diving in the ocean near our home on the island of Maui early that morning. We were all stunned to learn that he died at the exact time that I was having my crisis on the mountain. Although we were separated by more than 2,500 miles, I physically and psychically experienced every aspect of his dying process. While having no conscious knowing of what was happening to him, I long wondered if he was thinking of me. The horrible grief I went through that day made me vow to never to go through this kind of emotional torture again, and I made it my intention to finish the job my dad began when I was five, disconnecting my psychic abilities. It was a goal he failed to achieve as the seeing and hearing continued all my life, but after the first few times he called other priests to pour oil on my head and pray for me. Begging their god to remove the seville, I learned to keep my mouth zipped. Several years following the accident, I began to understand that my connection with my dad and others is not limited to genetics, that an energetic intention bonds us. This bond is infinitely greater than my need for my father or anyone else's approval. In this reunion, broad jumping what were fast being realized as vast and artificial boundaries, he taught me that love and pain are not conjoint twins, that sorrow is not inseparably entwined with physical death. While we may feel in our emotional bodies that love has been choked off forever, the drama of emoting is what often cuts us off from the truth that love is always in motion. Light the fluid bond that flows from the soul through the body and spirit forever. Once again, the still invisible director of this journey called for a wardrobe change. Another that I did not see or feel. Now draped in the most exquisite gown imaginable, a shimmering sea of ivory and mother of pearl that appeared to be alive. The fabric, woven of threads so fine as to be spider webs, seemed to be dappled with stardust, floating over my skin as if it was held afloat by a throng of imperceptible tiny angels. Lightness permeated my cells and soul as the cognitive light came on, and it dawned on me that this was not a gown. This glistening fabric was my energetic vibration, the signature of the divine, 
the essence that is who and what we all are, beings fashioned of exquisite, pure, and translucent light. Feeling like a bride as I moved toward the pinnacle, a single step took me over the threshold where I left my right footprint embedded in eternity. There, one fleeting glimpse of the spiral of sound and light charged and forever changed my life. Watching a cosmic loom weave this single strand into a brilliant tapestry, I saw light shuttled weft and warp fashioning a pattern. It was so complexly simple that I knew it could only be intentional, as it moved with absolute intention and compassion. This divine spinning wheel was time, music, braiding, a song of arcing angles. My knowing was that this music stirred the ethers, its rainbow of light, defining and filling space. Its weaving of light spun matter and connecting it into eternity. One step into the cosmic dance, I knew I was home. This homecoming with the infinite source of love led to the realization that my life simply one spark, a holographic piece of the whole. Within this light, for the first time in my life I knew absolute bliss, a fatal scratch in the record. Without warning, chaos slammed into me as a noise like a needle intentionally pushed down and pulled across on an old LP screeched. A violent sound filled my mind, heart, and the space as I began to physically fight with a demon. Engaged in a death or life struggle with this mysterious adversary, I was losing the fight, whatever was gripping my left ankle far stronger than I was. Unable to break free but determined to memorize the music and the pattern the loom was weaving the light into, I twisted, and looking back over my right shoulder, began to take memory snapshots.